Today is a great day to talk about wood lathes. When I was thinking about buying my first wood lathe, I had no idea where to start. So in this video, we're gonna talk about what lathe you should buy. So stick around. The most important question when buying a lathe is what do I want to turn? There are so many amazing projects you can turn on a wood lathe. For instance, bowls, pens, platters, hollow forms, lidded boxes, ornaments, toys, tool handles, and many others. If you have some experience and know what you would like to make, great. If you haven't, try a few projects out. Take a class or go to a club meeting. Get a feel for what you would like to do or what you gravitate toward. The next question is almost as important. What is my budget? With this decision, it is important to remember that the lathe is not the last thing you need to buy. Where would you be without turning tools, a chuck, a sharpening system, and all the other accessories you need to make your projects? I like it when Mike Mahoney talks about the lathe being the cheapest tool in your shop. Now he says that because you buy it once and it sits there and works every day over and over with very little maintenance. Another question that is not often considered is, would this lathe give me room to grow? Growth is an absolute necessity in life and wood turning. How do you want to develop yourself? What project can you move on to when you have the skills and the tools? When you start to look at lathes, you're going to see a big list of specifications. I want to talk to you about what those mean for you, as well as what features are nice to have. The first feature you want to look at that will have the most influence on what you are able to turn is the overall size of your lathe. There are typically three sizes of lathe. A mini lathe for small items like pens, honey dippers, small boxes, and small bowls. Then you have full size lathes. On this size you should be able to turn larger projects like large bowls and platters, unbalanced work, table legs, canes, hollow forms, and spindles and newel posts. There's a big area in between that people call a midi lathe. On a midi lathe, you might get the best of both worlds unless you need that extra capacity. One thing to keep in mind is that you can turn smaller projects on a big lathe, but you can't turn larger projects on a small lathe. Most lathes have extensions available to increase the length, however. When thinking about size, you also might want to consider the space you have to put your lathe. Will it have a space all its own and never need to move or be put away? Or will it have to be put away to do other projects in the shop? No, but seriously, small lathes are easy to move and large lathes, you'll most likely have to buy a mobile base to make them easier to move. So let's talk about features. The first one being capacity. How much wood could a wood lathe chuck if a wood lathe could chuck wood? One of the first specs you'll see is the swing over the bed. This will determine the maximum capacity of the diameter of piece you are turning. Measure from the bed to the center of the spindle and you get the radius. Times that by two and you have the swing over the bed. You also might want to consider the swing over the tool rest if you need to put the tool rest directly under your workpiece. The length of a piece you can turn is determined by the distance between centers. I found that the length of some of the centers I use decrease the amount of distance between centers given by the manufacturer, so watch out for that. The headstock is your business up front part of the lathe. There are some features on it that are really handy to know, such as the spindle thread size. Spindle thread size is determined by the diameter first, then the threads per inch. Some examples are 1 inch 8 TPI, or inch and a quarter 8 threads per inch. The larger the diameter of your spindle, the more rigid it will be for larger work. You need to know this for ordering face plates and chucks. A lot of chucks will come with a larger thread size and an insert that you can specify to fit the size of your spindle. Another spec is the spindle bore. This is the hole that goes all the way through the spindle. This can help with determining what size knockout rod you can use to knock out centers or what type of vacuum chuck adapters you can buy. Some direct drive lathes don't have a spindle bore. While they can still be used, it makes it more difficult to knock out your centers. 
Morse taper is the taper that you will see on the back side of your centers and accessories that fit inside the spindle and the tailstock quill. They will go in with a friction fit and are usually knocked back out. Common Morse taper sizes include number one, number two, and number three. Number one is very small and is only used on some small mini lathes. It is for very small projects like pens. I don't recommend getting a lathe with this size unless you are basically only turning pens. Most lathes from mini to full size use a number two Morse taper. If you start on a mini and want to upgrade your lathe, you don't have to buy all new centers and mandrels this way. Number three is basically only used on very large bowl lathes and industrial lathes and have accessories that can be hard to find. Your lathe's motor determines how much power you will have. Check out the horsepower of your motor and its power requirements to see if it will be enough. My first mini lathe has a small one half horsepower AC motor. I found that as I tried to do bigger and bigger projects, it would bog down even within the capacity that the lathe was supposed to have. Most constant speed lathes have an AC motor and you have to change the belt on a pulley to change speeds. Variable speed lathes have mostly a DC motor and a knob to control speed. You can have a mechanical variable speed in something like a Reeves drive. I've heard many wood turners say to stay away from this type of variable speed and others say that it works just fine, you just might have to do a little bit more maintenance and belt changes. You can spot a Reeves drive by the lever on the headstock. In higher end lathes you might find a DVR or digital variable reluctance motor that is good for maintaining a constant speed with very little power loss. Or you could also find a VFD or variable frequency drive lathe that makes use of a three phase motor on single phase power to deliver outstanding low speed torque. Whatever drive system you choose Make sure you have the correct voltage and have it on a circuit of the correct amperage called for by the manufacturer. I'd say having a variable speed is one of the most convenient features you can have on a lathe. Is it absolutely necessary? No. If you're starting out and you don't need the extra expense and you don't mind taking extra time to do speed changes, go for it. It's a feature that you will want for later though. Other convenient headstock features are a spindle lock to lock the spindle and remove items that are tight, spindle indexing for locking the spindle in different positions for creating patterns or flutes, sliding or rotating headstock makes outboard turning of larger pieces possible, digital readout so you know exactly how fast you're going, rubber tool mat for tool storage on top of the headstock. Extended spindle cone to allow more access around the back of a piece. Remote emergency stop so you don't have to reach around a spinning piece of wood to shut off the lathe. Hand wheel to rotate the spindle while the lathe is off. Easy access doors to belts. To make speed changes and speed range changes a lot easier. And a reverse switch so that you can sand in multiple directions. Features to consider on a tool rest banjo. Does it lock down well? Does it reach everything it needs to reach? Is it comfortable to use? Does it accept other sizes of tool rests I might need? There are standard sizes of tool rests you can buy and I've heard some tool rest banjos are a little off and may require some alteration to accept other sizes. Here are some things to consider on a tailstock. Tailstocks are a support feature and slide and lock to adjust for length. I think the most important feature on the tailstock is the quill. The quill is what slides in and out to bring support to your work. One of the specs you'll see is quill travel. To make it more convenient for drilling and boring, you need a long quill travel. You'll also want to take a look at the locking levers. Are they easy to use and in a convenient place and do they lock down everything well? Make sure that the quill moves in and out freely. It's way better if it's smooth. 
An item of convenience are measurements on the quill. You can tell how far you've gone and if they're laser etched, they don't wear off very easily. With a self-ejecting feature, if you back the quill back all the way, it ejects your center automatically. Some of the last things to consider are the weight and materials the lathe are made of. The heavier a lathe is, the more it handles unbalanced work and vibration. Cast iron is especially great at dampening vibration. That's why you'll see most lathes made from it. Some lathes experiment with other materials like steel or stainless steel for the bed or ways, and cast iron for the legs. My suggestion is you find a lathe with the properties you like and go for it. I had a great time hanging out with you in the shop today. I hope that what I had to say was helpful and informative. If it was, could you give me a like? Also, if you have any questions, put them in the comments down below and I'll try to get you an answer. On this channel, I do wood turning videos, so if that's what you're after, consider subscribing. Anyways, have a wonderful day, and we'll see you soon.